Before we get into the message, we wanted to say a special hello to our extended family around the world and also say thank you for joining us. Whether you're watching from our River of Life app, Facebook, or YouTube channels, we are so thankful to be connected with you. Praise God, it's so good to be here today. Wasn't that a great group of people? I just love hearing how God brings people to River of Life because that's always one of our prayers. Lord, bring everyone that you have for us, for this body, because the Bible says he puts them in a body. So bring them all and we will open Amen. our arms and our hearts wide and receive them. So that's a great group of people that we receive with very grateful hearts. We are continuing to talk about what's missing. What's missing? And this is actually, I think, part three of what's missing. A couple of weeks ago, my daughter and I joined my dad in Kentucky. It was the mountain uh, town of Stanton, Kentucky. And we were privileged to stay in a bed and breakfast there that the pastor and his wife ran. And as we were approaching there, he said, I need to tell you something. And he called. He said, now, I don't want you to be intimidated by our driveway because the driveway does go straight up. It just absolutely, he says, and if you're not careful, you're gonna get to the top of the hill and then you're gonna not be able to see where it comes out immediately. He said, but I'll tell you what you do. He said, focus on the tree in the background. As long as you look at the tree, you'll be okay and you'll be able to drive straight on into the driveway. And I did that and I focused on the tree didn't have a bit of problem, did not get disoriented, did not drive off the mountain, was safe. And, and, and because I had my focus on the right thing, I was able to stay the course. So what is missing? That, that started me thinking about what is missing in some of our lives. And I would have to say, it's the right focus. It's the right focus. You see, in this day where we can zoom in really, really close to things, sometimes we're zooming in and we're paying attention to the little tiny details when actually we should step back and perhaps see the big picture. Or sometimes God is showing us, desperately trying to show us some things that we need to know, yet we are so caught up in the needs of what we have personally and we are so focused on self that we cannot step aside to see what he's trying to show us. And I have to say that if our focus is wrong, we are in danger of getting off course, we are in danger of getting into deception, we are in danger of following the wrong voices and and listening to the wrong advice because we are focused on the wrong things. Hebrews 12, 2 says, we look away from the natural realm and we focus our attention and our expectation onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. This because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. He endured the agony of the cross and he conquered its humiliation. And now he sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus was able to see the cross. He knew very clearly what was awaiting him. But he was also able to see the big picture. He was able to look ahead and see you and I and know that we would be in his hands one day. And that was his joy. And because of the joy that was set before him, that affected every choice that he made. Many times we make choices without seeing the big picture, without focusing on what's to come. Many times we find ourselves in the wrong place at the wrong time because we're looking at the wrong things. How many relationships have fallen apart because one spouse or the other is focusing on that tiny, minuscule little fault and they're ignoring all the progress and all the good things that have been made? You know, many times I will tell myself as well as other women, you know, make a list of all the things that you love about your spouse. And there are those things. You married him for a reason. So make a list and don't focus on just the one little thing. You know, the Bible says, 
says, don't focus on the speck in your brother's eye and ignore the log in your own. And I have had to tell myself that over and over again because sometimes our relationships are in danger of falling apart because we're looking at the wrong things. We're looking at the wrong things for what God wants us to see. You know, sometimes we are in a season. The Bible tells us that to everything there is a season. And there's a season for everything. And sometimes we don't realize which season that we're in. I remember when our daughter, Ariana, was three. And she was very upset one day. She came to me and she said, she was very ambiguous, but I knew who she was talking about. She said, I don't understand. Some people go to school, talking about her brother and sister, and others don't, talking about herself. What Ariana at three didn't realize was that it was not her season to go to school. It didn't mean that she wouldn't ever go to school. She was going to be a schoolgirl, and, and when the day came, I would venture to say she probably thought, why was I so anxious to get here? But the season was not right. And many times, and I will tell you one thing, if the devil can't get you to ignore God's plan for your life, one of his tricks is to get you to jump in in the wrong timing. Jump in in the wrong season. Sometimes we're so anxious to do what it is that God has for us that we jump in, we anticipate, and we jump in before we're ready. And sometimes there are those of us that drag our feet, and either is wrong. We want to be in the right place at the right time. You know, the past two years, I've been focusing on some of the stories and accounts from the Old Testament of people's lives, and it's been fascinating for me. It's been, sometimes I actually feel like I'm living in the day and age of those people because I eat, breathe, and sleep and think about their lives because it's such an interesting, you know, that God gave it to us so we could learn from them. It's, it's not just in there by chance. Everything is for a purpose. And last week, we talked about the Shunammite woman, which is one of my heroes. Now, this week, I want to talk about some of the same characters from that story, the prophet Elisha and his servant Gehazi. And I want to talk about what happened to Gehazi when he got his focus wrong, when he had a focus failure, when he was looking at the wrong things, when he was not looking at what God was trying to point out, but he was looking at the wrong things. He was so blinded by self. And in 2 Kings 5, we read this story, and you can read about it later. It starts out with someone that has leprosy, Naaman, Naaman the Syrian. He had leprosy. And through a series of circumstances and people in his life, he heard about the prophet Elisha. He heard that Elisha was the servant of God, that Elisha had the power of God on his life, and that perhaps if he went, that he could actually be healed because of the power of God working through his servant, Elisha. And so Naaman did come. And you all know the story. You know that Naaman was actually insulted at first because Elisha didn't even come outside to meet him. Elisha sent his servant out and said, tell him to go, tell Naaman to go and dip in the river Jordan seven times and he'll be healed. And at first Naaman was so insulted he couldn't do it, but he was talked into it and he ended up being obedient, went to the river Jordan dipped seven times, and he was completely and totally healed. So then he went back to Elisha, and he said, you know, I know for a fact that this God that you serve is the one true God, is the only God. I've seen the evidence of his healing power on my life. I had leprosy, and now I'm totally healed. And then he said this. He said to Elisha, what kind of gift can I give you? Please let me give you a gift. Now, Elisha refuses. Let me just interject this. There's nothing wrong with receiving a gift. And Elisha himself at other times did receive gifts. But he was following the Lord's will in this particular time. He clearly felt that he shouldn't. Well, after Naaman leaves, Gehazi, the servant, starts to think about it. And you can almost see his train of thought. Why? Because he is so totally human in this time. And you may even recognize some of the attitudes that he has in our own lives. And so he begins to think about it, and he thinks, you know, and by this time, the Bible tells us that he had been a servant of Elisha for 15, 20 years. The rabbis, the history tells us that. And so, you know, he probably thought, well, 
It's about time I started earning my due. You know, I work hard too. I work as hard as Elisha does. And you know, I don't think that he, I don't understand why he had to speak for me when he refused that gift. And you know, he began to think, you know, I really could have used some new clothes and I can always use money. And so he began to dwell on that. And you know, he forgot what the focus should be. He forgot that he was just part. He was privileged to be part of an extraordinary miracle. He was privileged to see Naaman healed from one minute to the next of leprosy, which was the plague of that day, which was the worst thing that you could get. And he was part of that. And he got to be part of that outpouring of the Spirit of God. The Bible doesn't tell us of anyone else who witnessed that miracle, but Elisha had a front row seat. He was able to be part of that. He forgot all of that. He forgot that he was put in Elisha's life to serve. He forgot that perhaps this was an opportunity to learn. He forgot that maybe Elisha had a reason for saying no to the gifts. And if he had asked him, maybe he could have grown in the ways of the Lord and in the ways of wisdom. And he most certainly forgot that Elisha was a prophet because he thought that he could get away with what he was about to do. I don't know how he thought that. Let me, and let me just say this, children, if your parents, if God thinks your parents need to know something that you're doing wrong, he will tell them. Don't think that he will not. He doesn't always. I think sometimes he spares the parents and, and allows them to be just in a place of prayer. But sometimes God will pull the curtain back and he will show you things about your kids, your natural kids, your spiritual kids. And many times you won't be allowed to say a word about it for a while. You're just going to pray about that. And then later they might come to you and say, did you know that? And you say, yeah, I did know that. But I couldn't say anything about it because I just brought it to the Lord in prayer. But, but Gehazi forgot that Elisha most certainly would have had the prophetic spirit on him, and he would have known what happened next. Well, what happened next was just almost unbelievable. Gehazi goes, and he uses Elisha's name to ask for something that Elisha never asked for. He goes, and he runs after Naaman, and he said, you know what, Naaman? My master Elisha sent me to come after you. You know, you ask if we wanted a gift. Well, actually, we do want one. We want a talent of silver and two changes of clothes because we're going to receive out-of-town guests. Well, Elisha hadn't asked for anything of the sort. Gehazi used his name to, and to speak for him, and that was a grievous, grievous offense. You know, sometimes some people speak for us, and I'm always um, very surprised later. Oh, I said that? Uh, because they will think that if you say, well, Pastor Chris said then it'll get something done. And sometimes people speak on our behalf and it may not be exactly how it was. I don't know, that, that was for free right there. But Gehazi lost his focus. All he could think about was, what's in it for me? When he became overwhelmed with concern for himself, it's not hard to see the trail that his thoughts led him down. It's not hard, and you see, he did something that if you had told him beforehand that he was going to lie and deceive and ask for something that Elisha had never asked for, he probably would have said, no, I'll never do that. But you see, he got his focus wrong. He wanted the wrong things. And so the enemy will exploit our focus. He will exploit it. One of the things I found myself praying for my own kids and my ch spiritual children this week, and I found myself, and I, sometimes the Holy Spirit will speak even when you're praying, and I found myself praying something that had three Ds. I, I felt like the Lord was saying, the enemy will come to try and distract, and then he will discourage, and then he will deceive. You see, if you allow yourself to be distracted, then you open the door to be discouraged. And if you're discouraged, then you open the door even further to be deceived. And so what the enemy will go after first is your focus. He will try and distract you from the right things. However, there's good news. If you or I miss the mark, and if we get distracted, and if we fall into some things like Gehazi did, 
The good news is that we have a Savior that's just waiting for us to bring our sin to him, to repent and say, Lord, I got off track. I got off focus. I made some wrong choices because my focus was off course. Lord, forgive me and give me a brand new start. I had to, to think this morning because it's the eighth day of the eighth month. Eight is the num number of new beginnings. If there is something that you have gotten off track in, then this day, 8-8, eight, eight, is your new beginning. Because God will not turn you away if you come to him in repentance and ask him to get you back on course and to allow you to see the right things and focus on what he's showing you. Back to Gehazi, because you see, I believe there was a wonderful outcome from his life. When he sinned, Elisha pronounced a curse of leprosy. He said, Naaman's leprosy is going to cling to you. And it did. And that, that was a very sad result of sin. But two chapters ahead, there is a story in 2 Kings 7 that talks about four lepers that are sitting by the gate, that are sitting by the gate of the Syrian camp. You see, by this time they were at war and the Syrians had attacked Samaria and there was no food anywhere. And so the lepers had gone out and history tells us this was Gehazi and his sons. And they were sitting by the gate and they didn't know what to do because they didn't see anybody around. And finally, one of them says, you know what? Why are we sitting here? We're going to die of hunger anyway. Let's go in and see what's in there. And they went to only to find that the Syrians had deserted the camp, had left provision, had left food, had left all sorts of things. And they went in and they were overwhelmed with joy and they began to grab at it. And then they said, you know what? It's not right that we should hoard all this to ourselves. Let's send someone and tell the king the good news that there's food to be had. The Syrians have abandoned the camp and there's many things here. And you see the difference in the attitude from way back when, when he wanted to hoard and lie and deceive and he was so covetous that he had to have those clothes and that silver. And now he refused to hoard it. He refused to take it to himself. He refused to say, I'm going to keep all this just for me and my sons. It's time that we share the good news. And so you see a turnabout in that, just those two chapters. And then the next thing, and this is what I read in the footnotes of my, of my Bible, which many times you can read some of the best things in the footnotes. The rabbis believe that Gehazi was healed of his leprosy. Why? Because Kings was in chronological order. And so by the time that the next chapter came around, we see Gehazi sitting in the presence of the king talking about the miracles of Elisha. And he would never have been allowed to sit in the presence of the king if he had had leprosy. And I believe that it was because of our father's mercy and because of his grace that he took someone that knew he had sinned, but that had turned around and repented and healed him of his leprosy and allowed him to tell the testimony and the story of what the Lord had done through the prophet Elisha. That's our Jesus. That's our Savior. Savior. That's the one who never withholds any good thing from you and I when we come to him in repentance and we come to him willing to turn and willing to lay our lives out. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. What a turnaround. What a second chance. What a forgiving Lord. Philippians 3.13 says, I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. It's very simple, really. Focus on Jesus. Focus on what he says. Focus on what he says about you and about me. Focus on his love. Focus on his plan for your future. Focus on loving God and loving others. And as we keep our focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we will be in the right place, we'll be strongly in his purpose, we'll be in the right timing, and we will not be moved. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The missing piece of focus. The next piece that is missing is the piece 
that's called order, godly order. There's an order to things in the natural. We teach little children how to order certain things. You do this first, and then you do this next. When I got dressed this morning, I put my socks on first, and then my shoes. I put my pants on first, and then my belt. I put my shirt on, and then I put my tie on. There's a natural order to things. Any scientist will tell you that there is a natural order to things. Anyone can observe it. The heavens declare it. All of natural science speaks to a God of order. There is an order to things. There is a spiritual order to things as well that is even more real, and it's even more essential to life, and it can really be summed up in one phrase, and that is God first. God first. It starts with God. In the beginning, God. God established the order. God established the order, and he is an orderly God. And Jesus is the king of an orderly kingdom. In Isaiah chapter 9, the Bible says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it. Can you say that with me? To order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of order. And Jesus is the king that orders it and establishes it in righteousness, and it will be accomplished, and that's all there is to it. The church is an orderly group, an orderly family. There is order in the local church. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the apostle Paul admonishes the Corinthians and says, Therefore, believers desire earnestly to prophesy to foretell the future, to speak new messages from God to the people, and do not forbid speaking in unknown tongues. But all things must be done appropriately and in an orderly manner. So we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe in speaking in tongues. We believe in prophetic utterances. But we also believe in order. One of the things that churches that are quote-unquote Pentecostal, charismatic, whatever, whatever you might uh, uh, choose to term them, full gospel, You've heard all of the different labels. We try not to label ourselves like that. We're just river of life. We believe what the Bible says, but there is a, there's a certain attraction that churches like this have, at least in the beginning, for people that tend to be disorderly. And they are shocked when they find out that there is order. And they can't just do whatever they want and whatever they feel like the Spirit is leading them to do. And there's a fine line between flowing in the Holy Ghost and liberty and disorder. And, and it, it's, it's uh, very similar to uh, a courtroom sometimes where the judge will have to crack that gavel down and make a little bit of noise and call people to attention. And there is disorder in the court. Sometimes there is disorder in the courts of the Lord. And somebody needs to call the folks back to attention and say, now, wait a minute, this isn't appropriate. This is inappropriate. Let's do it decently and in order. There's an order to things. There's an orderly kingdom. The kingdom of God is not a kingdom of disorder. God is not the author or the creator of chaos. He's not, he's not the, 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 the one who authors that or, or births that. That comes out of our own fallen sinful nature. Have you noticed that when you have a house full of kids, that order is not natural? That if you're going to have order, you're going to have to really kind of demand it, insist on it, teach it, teach it tomorrow, teach it the next day, uh, teach it the day after that. Years of teaching. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. I was in a home the other day, and there was a thing on the wall, and maybe you have one of these on your wall, and it says, you know, if you open it, close it. If you, if you dirty the dish, then wash it. Uh, that, that, if, you, if it's on the floor, pick it up. If you threw it down, pick it up. And, and why do we have those things? Because we need to be reminded constantly that there is an order to life, an order in the natural life. And things will go much smoother if people will just get their act together and get in order. And if they don't get in order, then it's a mess. Nobody has a good time. You can have a party. If it's disorderly, nobody has fun. Nobody enjoys it. Could have been fun, should have been fun, would have been fun, but there was no order. There's no order. It's 
perverse, isn't it? That in our fallen human nature, we rebel against order. You're fine with the order you create. You just hate everybody else's order. You're fine telling people about the order that you want them to follow. But when they try to tell you the order that you should follow, then you push back. Then you got a problem with that. Then you got an issue with that. Nobody tells me what to do. I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that and I don't want anybody trying to organize my life and tell me to do this and tell me to do that. And there's something that rises up within us as soon as we hear what order looks like or see what it looks like or are told what it looks like. There's something that rises up in us to rebel against that. And I know that we don't have any rebellious people here this morning. I know there are no rebellious homes out there online watching. But I just know that I have struggled with order sometimes. Why does it have to be this way? Why can't it be this way? Why can't I do it the way I want to do it? Why does, why does two have to follow one? Why can't it be two one? Why can't it just be some random thing? Why can't I just make it up as I go along? It's because God is a God of order. And because God is a God that has a kingdom that is an orderly kingdom. And none of us are going to be able to drag our disorder into his kingdom and cause problems there. Nobody's going to be able to do that. And nobody's going to be able to come into the local church and cause problems and disorder there either. Now, some churches don't have enough authority in place to really deal with that. So there are people that will come in and split churches. There are people that will come in and whisper and, and, and start trouble and cause trouble. And then when they've uh, worked their work, they'll go on to another church and they'll cause trouble there. And nobody will stop them. Nobody will confront them because church people are supposed to be nice. And we're supposed to be nice and orderly. You're not shouting me down now, but it's just human nature. I'm in this with you all the way. When I want to do something and somebody gets in front of me and says, no, you can't go in there, I want to know why. I want to know who, who made that, that rule up. That's a stupid rule. I should be able to go in there. There's no reason why I can go in there. It's not going to hurt anybody if I go in there. Let me go in there. No, you can't go in there. We struggle with that. Our children struggle with that. That's why we want to start early with our kids, training them to be orderly kids, not to be disorderly. There are things that, well, what does that matter? Well, why do I have to do that? Well, it's because I'm training you in the principles of being orderly. So that when you get dressed, let's do it right. When, you, when, you, when we take you over to somebody else's house, let's do it right. When we sit up at the table, let's do it right. Let's let there be an order to life because order is part of what God has gifted us with so that things will work the way that he intended for them to work. And when we buck against it, we have problems. The Bible says, command those among you who are living disorderly lives to shape up. And the Bible even says, those that refuse to shape up that are disorderly, don't fellowship with them, don't have anything to do with them. We struggle with scriptures like that. Very seldom are they applied. The context is specifically amongst those that felt like Jesus was coming back, so, so uh, his, his return was so imminent, like it could be any second now. Let's just sit around and wait for the Lord to come. And they had quit planting their fields. They had quit tending their livestock. They had quit raising, uh, you know, any kind of crop that they could, that they could eat. And, and, and they stopped working and they stopped doing for themselves because there was no point because Jesus was coming back at any moment. The Apostle Paul jumped on that and he said, listen, work is part of God's order for man. And if anybody doesn't work, don't let them eat. So you can see how the culture today fights against that. God says work is the order of the day. And, and, and the powers that are ruling in our culture today on every level say, no, 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 you don't want to do that. Only suckers do that. You want to do it this way. You want to do it that way. You want to do it your way. So we get down to doing it our way, and order has consequences. In the Bible, there's the story of King David trying to return the Ark of the Covenant, was the, which was which was the signature symbol in the culture of Israel of the presence of God. It was the, the physical, tangible example of what set them apart from every other people group on the planet. We have the ark. We have the presence of God. Other people have their stuff, but that's not God. We have the presence of the Lord. God commanded Moses to put this thing together it's made exactly the way that God told Moses to make it, and it's central to our worship. It is in the holiest part of the 
temple or the tabernacle, and it's the very presence of God, the very symbol of the presence of God. And David said, I, I'm living in a house, and, uh, and, and, and uh, the Ark of the Covenant is not even close. It's, it's, it's off here in another place, and I want to bring it. I want to bring it home, and I'm going to go get it, and I'm going to bring it home. And he was excited about it. He knew that God had told him to do that, and it was in his heart. So they had a cart, an ox cart, and they got some guys to help and these guys were helping, and they put the Ark of the Covenant on an ox cart, and they're trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant from point A to point B, and the oxen stumble, or they hit a big rock in the road, and the cart begins to rock back and forth, and it looks like the Ark is going to fall off the Ark, fall off the cart, and so a man named uh, Uzzah, or Uzzah, he uh, puts his hand out, to uh, prevent something bad from happening. He's thinking, man, it would be awful, wouldn't it, if this holy, sacred symbol of the presence of God were to fall off of this cart. Man, I would be in trouble, and the king would be really upset with me, and, and we can't let that happen. So he reaches out to steady it, and he touches it. And when he touches it, he instantly dies. And fear comes upon everybody. And they stop right in their tracks. This guy drops over dead because he touched the Ark of the Covenant. And David is upset. He's angry with God. He doesn't understand how this could possibly have happened. He doesn't understand what God is doing. How can you do this? We're, we're trying to honor you, and we're doing the best that we can. And, and, and what did he do after all? He just reached up to do a good thing and keep the Ark from falling off the cart. And he's, he's angry with the Lord. They, they pull off, and the ark winds up staying in the home of a guy whose name is Obed-Edom. And it winds up staying there for three months. And it takes David three months to figure out what happened. It takes him a full 90 days before he wakes up and figures out what happened. And what happened was, there was, in the Scriptures, clear instructions about how the ark was to be moved and who was to move the ark. And... Uh, there were clear instructions about the penalties for anybody who was not authorized to ever even come near it or ever touch it or ever have anything to do with it. And there were clear biblical instructions that were written down for anybody to read, anybody to study. Anyone should have known that. The king should have known that before he ever even embarked upon this process of trying to move the ark from point A to point B. And so the Bible says that after David had built for himself a, uh, houses in the city of David, he prepared a place for the ark of God and he pitched a tent for it. And then David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests and for the Levites, for Uriel and Isaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel and Aminadab. And he said to them, you are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. We did not consult him about the proper order. It's very clear that man's order is a violation of God's order. However you're ordering your life, if it is not God's order for life, it is in violation of God's order. It may be culturally cool. It may be what everybody does. It may be the new thing, the latest, the greatest. It may make you fit in with the people that you want to fit in with. It may be appealing to your logic, to your intellect, to your educational background, to books that you've read, people that you pay attention to, your favorite influencer, whatever it might happen to be. But if you're not living your life, and if I'm not ordering my life after God's order for life, I am living in violation of godly order. I am disorderly, I am out of order, and it does not work. Man's order results in death, in fear, and in anger. The result of not doing things in an orderly fashion left one man dead and 
the frustration of David, angry, afraid of God. How can I serve a God like this? How can I be around a God like this? How can I, how can I do this, do what's right, do what I feel like I'm supposed to do? God, who are you? What have you done? What kind of a God are you? It's important for us not to create our own God and then worship him because he's, he'll become then a God after our own image. The God that we worship is a God of order. You may say, well, he's this and he's that and he's loving and he's kind. Yes, he's all of that. He's also a God of order. God was not abandoning his love when he upheld his word, which is forever settled in heaven. And there were consequences for disorder. That's not unloving. That's not ungracious. That's not unkind. God is a God of order. God is a God who has established that order. And the Bible says that he will do it with justice and it will come to pass. Man's recognition and acceptance of godly order results in blessing. It results in blessing. So whatever you're doing, whatever I'm doing, and we're experiencing all of the things that David experienced. We're angry with God because things aren't working out the way that we think that they should. We're afraid. We're not experiencing life. As a matter of fact, it feels like we're just dying. Our business is dying. Our marriage is dying. Our family is dying. Physically, we're dying. Everything around us is just drying up. Maybe the missing piece that needs to be reestablished in our life is godly order. Maybe we need to just step back and say, listen, is, is my arrangement of things, is it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, according to the Lord's order? Or have I decided to randomly just sort of mix this up and just do it any old way I wanted to? And instead of putting first things first, I'm just going to leave that out completely. And I'm going to do this because this is easier. I'm going to do this because this will get me ahead and this will get me where I want to go faster, or this will be more comfortable, more pleasurable. This will require less discipline. Why should I discipline myself when I can get it without having to work for it? I don't have to bring my life into order. I can be a disorderly person, and somehow God loves me, and he loves the chaos of my life, and he loves to see me live in frustration. No, he loves you too much to leave you disorderly. God wants to straighten you out. He wants to straighten me out. And oftentimes, we never connect the dots and see that there is a direct link between our disorderly decisions and our disorderly conduct and the consequences that we're living right now. And I want to make that connection today and help you with that. And I'm speaking to myself. Nobody's life is perfect. Everyone is dealing with something. None of us are so sharp and so intelligent and so quick-witted that we're able to pick up all the missing pieces and this one sometimes is very obscure and difficult for us to pinpoint. We just can't figure it out. Lord, I feel like I, I'm just living in an orderly fashion. I feel like I've got all my I's dotted and my T's crossed. And yet, the Word of God is true, even if I don't understand exactly how it connects with me at this particular moment in time. So how does God work with us? God doesn't just simply lash out at us and punish us because we're, we're disorderly. How do you deal with a disorderly child? You patiently bring them into line. You bring them into order. You say, no, that's not how you wait. That's not the way that you do that. Uh, the Bible says those whom he loves, he chastises. I thank God for the pain that every time, every time there's disorder, there's pain. I thank God for that. Pain tells me something's wrong. And pain tells me that what I'm doing is not right. And I usually don't give in to the first sign of pain because I want to be tough. Don't you want to be tough? And you just say, well, it hurts a little bit, but I'm just going to keep pushing. So I'll double down on disorder, thinking that if I push a little bit harder, eventually I'll break through and it won't hurt anymore. And when you're out of order, that never happens. You can push and push and push all you want and you're never going to break through because God is a God of order. He's never going to allow you to have victory in disorder and chaos. Victory only comes in submission and coming into line with God's order for living. Amen? Amen? Anything outside of God's order is in violation of God's order. It's not a small thing. It's not a little offense. It's not a little infraction. It's not a nothing. It's a big something. And it's a big source of pain and suffering in people's lives. Coming into order and submitting to God and trusting Him and believing that if I do it His way, 
that I'm going to succeed and I'm going to be blessed and the people around me are going to be blessed is the only way for us to begin to move forward. But that requires repentance, turning around, submitting to God, coming under the authority of God's word. But God is gracious. God is merciful. And if I were you today, I would, uh, I would do what I'm doing. And that is, I would just simply say, God, wherever my life is out of order, would you just reveal that to me? I'm not conscious of anything right at the moment, but Lord, I know that there are things that you would show me if I would open my heart and allow you to speak to me. I know that there are things that probably are not in line with your plan for my life. I've just been so busy. I've been under so much pressure. I've been so distracted. I've been running to and fro. I'm not really conscious of anything, but that doesn't mean it's not there. But I'm trusting you to reveal it to me. I'm trusting you to align my life with your plans, your principles, your word, so that I can experience the fullness of life and be the kind of light that shines in the darkness in this world in which we're living today. So many people are living in chaos. They're going to be drawn to people that are walking in an orderly fashion. They're, people are running around with their hair on fire. I mean, they're running around in a panic. They don't know their right hand from their left. And they're going to be looking for people that are not doing that. And the people that are not doing that are going to be the ones that have ordered their lives after godly order, submitted to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Amen. Let God order your life. Let God order your steps. He'll do it. Submit to Him. Trust Him. Amen. I've done it both ways. I've had experience in, in both realms, being disorderly and then coming into order. And I know the pain of disorder. I know the, the shame of it. I know the hurt that it causes, not only the hurt that it's caused me, but the hurt that it's caused others. And I also know the joy and the peace, the authority that I walk in when I'm walking in an orderly fashion before the Lord. And I invite you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy today covering our lives. Thank you for each person that is here. And now, Lord, we thank you for touching hearts, even earlier in the service, Lord, where people raised their hands and wanted to confess Christ as their Lord and Savior and put their trust in Him. Lord, I pray that you would touch every heart. And Father, there's no greater uh, disorder than the life of a person who's never surrendered their life to Christ. There's no greater chaos, no greater confusion than is experienced in the soul of a man or a woman that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And Father, I pray that you would begin to move by your marvelous grace today and move mightily in the hearts of people so that they would come out of the chaos, come out of the darkness, come out of the disorder and all of the disorganization that's taking place and that they would come into alignment with your will for their lives so that peace might come, joy might come, and blessing might manifest. So we ask you to do that, Holy Spirit, by the power of God in every heart today that is far from Jesus, every heart that does not know him, as Lord and Savior. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, some of you already raised your hands. I'd like to ask you to raise them again if you want to receive Christ. Some of you didn't, but you want to now. You want to bring your life to the Lord, your heart to the Lord. You want to surrender to Jesus Christ. I see that one. I see that one. Some of you are in the balcony. Some of you may be joining us online. You raise your hand right where you are in the living room. Anyone else? Raise your hand. Pastor, pray for me. I want to get right with God. I want to receive Christ. Some of you may be backslidden and you have been saved and you've walked away from the Lord, gone back into sin, and God's calling you out of the darkness into the light. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and restore you to fellowship, but you've got to come to Him. Raise your hand if that's you. Pastor, pray for me. Backslidden, ready to come back to the Lord. If you're not saved, Raise your hand saying, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my heart to Christ. Let's all stand to our feet, please. That's going to help those that have raised their hand to receive prayer today. If you raised your hand, I want you to come. I want to pray for you. Those of you that are coming to Jesus, you're recommitting your life to Christ, you come. If you raise your hand, you step out from where you are and come. right up here. Let's encourage them as they come. If you're in the balcony, you come.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we'll wait for just a minute. Make sure we've got everybody. So if you're coming, come quickly. I don't want to get started without you. Those of you that have stepped forward, I want you to pray this with me. I know that uh, God's dealing with you, and we're thankful for that. And He knows what you need, and He knows what's, what's happening in your heart and in your life. But I want to lead you in prayer. And I want you to pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I give you my heart. I put my trust in you. I declare with my mouth that you're my Savior. You're the Lord of my life. I believe in my heart that you died for my sins and rose again. Change my life. Make me a new person. Break the chains of sin and iniquity off of my life. I want to serve you. I want to live for you all the days of my life. So I present myself today freely to you. Take my life change it and get glory from it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.